OK, hi, everyone. My name is James Powell. We're going to try that again. Hi, everyone. My name is James Powell. Hi, James. So those of you who knew what to do may have already seen me at some Python events. Um, but today, we're at RStats NYC. It's April 24th. And if you are interested in this talk, or interested in Python, or interested in connecting to me after this talk, I am don't use this code on Twitter. You can also email me at james at don't use this code .com. And I'm eventually planning to resurrect my blog at seriously.don'tusethiscode.com. There are a lot of puns. I run NYC Python, as Jared said. We are the world's largest and most active meetup group right here in New York City. We have a humongous data science community of people using Python. And I'm sure they also use R and Julia if they have to. Um, <laughs> in terms of events, we have office hours on Tuesdays, study groups on Saturdays and Sundays. We have headline events every other Thursday. There's a lot of activity in that community. Uh, I also work with NumFocus, which is the 501c3 that provides financing for projects like Julia, IPython Notebook. Uh, it also finances NumPy, SciPy, and a lot of critical parts of the Python data science ecosystem. We also run the PyData conference series. So about an hour after I give this talk, I will be on a flight to Dallas for PyData Dallas. Our next big upcoming event is PyData Seattle. It'll be held at Microsoft's headquarters for about 1,000 people. I'm sure Jared will be there speaking, as we've invited him to speak at a number of PyData events in the past. In addition to that, I also help organize the Open Data Science Conference. Uh, we're holding an event in Boston on the 30th and 31st of May. This is a conference across all languages and all tools, R, Python, Julia. There's even going to be some Hadoop and Spark people there talking about open source data science. It's going to be a humongous event. We're planning for 1,000 attendees. And I think we already have Jared speaking. Uh, I think Wes is speaking. We have a number of other high profile R speakers. So I actually usually speak about Python, software engineering, applications to quant finance, data science, and machine learning. Um, I've given a couple of talks this year. And if you're interested in what I talk about, you can find me at a couple of different events. I spoke at Pi Tennessee earlier this year. I gave a lightning talk at PyCon in Montreal. I'm speaking here today. I'll be speaking in Dallas tomorrow. I'll be speaking at the Open Source Data Science Conference in May. I'll be speaking in London for PyData, Seattle for PyData. When you help organize the events, you can get your talks in really easily. Pi Gotham as well in New York. And you can see they even scroll off the bottom of the screen. So today's talk is called Integration with the Vernacular the NumPy approach. In this talk, I'm trying not to belabor mathematical analogies. What I'd like to do is talk about engineering, software engineering as a discipline unto itself, distinct from mathematics and distinct from computer science. I'm trying to, through this talk and a couple other talks I've given, create a language around engineering modeling and engineering as a process. That is, the, the purpose of writing software is to accomplish some business goal. It's subordinated to some business goal. And so there is a field unto itself of what it means to sit down and write software that accomplishes this task. And there's a need for a language or a theoretical framework for us to be able to discuss and analyze the kind of code that we write. We could say, if we wanted to belabor a mathematical analogy, that the process of writing software is very similar to constructing an algebra. We take some objects in some well-defined domain. That's the data input that we have. We create an algebra, which involves operations on those data, on those elements. We assert certain properties of those operations. So you can think we have things like triangular properties. Um, in linear algebra, we have a number of properties regarding the rank and dimensions of matrices. Given these properties, we can then encode the model, and we can accept arbitrary objects within the domain and assert that the properties still hold. So we can think of software engineering really as this construction of an algebra, a well-defined algebra, and ensuring that that algebra maps to the actual business problem we're trying to solve and ensure that that algebra can be encoded in the language of a, program, of a programming language. Now, one thing that I'll say is I've constructed this talk to be maximally inscrutable to the audience. So I'm going to start by discussing the title. And to do that, we're going to, we're going to go back in time for a little bit of history. We're going to talk about the May 4th movement. The May 4th movement was a literary, cultural, and political movement that started the 4th of May, 1919, in China, started in Beijing. And there are a lot of authors who are associated with the May 4th movement. Uh, Lu Xun, Mao Dun, and Lao Se. These are authors who were associated closely with the political movement here, with the literary movement. And one of the interesting characteristics of their literary movement was the introduction of written literary vernacular Chinese. Prior to the May 4th movement, 
all literary Chinese. Everything that somebody would write in a book was written in classical Chinese. And this is, you can imagine if we still use Shakespearean English up until the early 20th century in order to write our normal books. This is the situation there. And the May 4th movement was a liberalization of that, was an introduction of a vernacular Chinese, the introduction of a, spo of a type of language similar to how one speaks in written texts. When we talk about classical Chinese, we can sometimes distinguish between classical Chinese and literary Chinese. But one characteristic of classical or literary Chinese is the existence of these four character, or these often four character phrases, what we call chan yu. And one example of a chan yu for you guys is um, falling leaves return to the roots. This is a phrase that's often used, it's a phrase with a set meaning that's often used to refer to, for example, how as people age, they want to go back to where they came from. We can see that the same thing exists in English. I mean, if you think about how many books or how many movies are named after specific phrases taken out of Shakespearean works. I mean, think about it. Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country is an example. Much Ado About Nothing spawned a lot of these. Um, the number of songs or literary works that just take single phrases that we assume to be parts of English, but were actually lifted from inventions by Shakespeare himself. Well, this is the situation with these idiomatic expressions in Chinese. Unfortunately, it turns out if we look up one of these idiomatic expressions, like luo ye gui gen, falling leaves return to the root, we can see that it comes from a Buddhist text from the Song Dynasty. And we can actually see the specific terminology that was used. And if we look up that Buddhist text, all of this stuff is online. You can see it's actually a conversation between a master and a pupil. And the master responds to, this, to a question to the pupil with this set phrase. Then over the hundreds of years, this is distilled to single four characters that's gen incorporated into everyday language. One very interesting thing about this is when you look up the exact phrasing in the historical text, the first two characters are swapped. So you can see an example here where you have a set phrase and it's entered into the vernacular. It's something that you'd say in everyday conversation or something that you'd write in a book. And it's diverged from the historical version of it in order to be more amenable to how people actually speak. But it's still this fixed entity. One example of the use of these vernacular phrases in just spoken Chinese or written Chinese is a sentence like this, the proposal is not guaranteed to go through. And if you look closely at the proposal, you'll see a fixed character phrase here that's been used as an adverbial clause. This is, this is the term li suo dang ran, which means, which conveys the meaning of guaranteed. And they're using this as an adverbial phrase in order to, or in some adverbial context, in order to modify that the proposal is not going to go through. If we look at this phrase and we go through the stages of looking it up, we can find that it also comes from some, we can also see that it comes from some text, from some long forgotten text. I couldn't even find very easily the text that this came from. And you can see that in the original text, it's phrased in a completely different way. So you can see that there, this phrase, integration with the vernacular, describes a situation in which we have this acrolect, this subset of a language that exists in these set units that has a very fixed contained meaning, but is not really divisible and is very obviously foreign to the vernacular. That is, imagine if every other word I invoked a line from Shakespeare in this talk here. And you'd be able to pick those out very easily. It would sound very foreign. And this is the situation that you have in even modern written Chinese. So how does that relate to anything programming? Well, let's talk about NumPy. And some of you may be familiar with NumPy. NumPy is a library for numerical computing. It underlies tools that you may use, like Pandas, Scikit-Learn. It's closely associated with another library, SciPy. There's a lot of overlap between the two of them. And if we really ask ourselves, what is NumPy? We might look at NumPy and see that we can import things like inv and invert matrices. So we may say it's a library of functions or algorithms. We might see that from NumPy, we can import things like FFT and, and perform fast Fourier transformations. And we might say, well, that also kind of makes sense. It's some signal analysis toolkit. But what NumPy fundamentally is, is the NumPy ND array. It's some structure that allows you to perform computations on large sets of data. So the most fundamental part of NumPy and the most interesting part of NumPy, and what takes up 90% of the NumPy user's guide, is a discussion of this ND array. It's a simple array type that allows you to do things like broadcast operations. You can multiply every entity by 10. That allows you to do fancy indexing. That allows you to do all sorts of multi-dimensional calculations. You can sum. You can look at averages with a specific axis, and so on. And one interesting characteristic of it is, distinct from 
the Python language itself, NumPy and the arrays are specialized on a D type, a data type. In this particular case, the D type is a 64 bit integer, which is very unusual in Python because Python's numeric type is, is uh, it has a full numeric tower. So there's automatic promotion from uh, small integers to big integers in Python, and there's no distinction between the size of an integer in Python. Whereas in NumPy, everything's actually specialized on the machine types itself. What you can think of is that NumPy provides a constrained computation environment. It provides an environment in which you specialize on the types and operations that they're performed, and you have a certain set of assumptions that are baked into your use of NumPy, namely an independence of the entries. So for example, when we're doing a broadcasting operation in NumPy, when we take an array full of values and we multiply times 10, and every value inside gets multiplied by 10, by specializing that array on a, on a data type like an integer 64, which has no ability to encode relations between the entities, you can then allow the computer to perform specialization such as doing all of this in some parallel fashion, because the computer knows that there's no interrelation between the entities. So it knows it can go off and spawn 10 threads, or use 10 cores, or use a GPU in order to actually perform this multiplication. It knows, because you've told it by some mechanism, that these entities are completely unrelated to each other, so that an operation can be performed by them without any interdependencies in the data. And this is not something that you've explicitly encoded, but it's an implicit result of having to use some of these machine types. What you can think of is that NumPy forces you into this very restricted, very constrained domain. Because an example, for example, in Python, if you took a list of, of objects and you wanted to perform an object on all of them, you want to do a map over them or a fold over all of them, you wouldn't be able to automatically parallelize them because there could be any arbitrary code running behind any of these objects, and there may be interdependencies in the objects, and doing it in parallel may result in some race hazards or some other data errors. We can, cons we can, we can contrast the NumPy approach to an approach that you might, you might have seen in what you might call an integrated graph computing environment. So there are integrated approaches. There is a real contrast being made here. And I'm sure everybody's seen some approach that looks like this. Uh, this is an approach that you might take from finance. So for example, if you wanted to price a book of instruments or a book of positions, you might have some, pos some book object that contains position objects. And you say, the value of this book is the sum of the values of the positions. The positions are the values of the individual positions are the size of the position times the prices of the positions. If the positions happen to be bonds, the price is the dirty price, and the dirty price can be broken into the clean price and the accrual. If it's an amortizing bond, you have extra steps, and you can break it down. And this API is a common one that you may have seen for establishing a graph on this computation. So that when you're trying to price your portfolio, you say, well, the actual price of the portfolio has some graph of computations related to it. And if I change this one computation here, like if I bump a recovery rate, and it causes all these recalculations, I can minimally recalculate what's necessary in order to reprice this portfolio. And the way that you might encode that is in this fashion in which the actual graph computation is implicit in the structure of the code that you've written. You haven't specifically said, here's the part of my code where I'm explicitly giving the dependencies for the graph and where I'm explicitly calculating what needs to be recomputed. Instead, you're smearing it through the entire code base. And in that code base, you could think that for any one of these classes, you may have a number of operations that are completely unrelated to the computation. You might have operations that are used for user output. You might have the bond being able to provide information about its regulatory or its legal characteristics. There may be a lot in there that's unrelated to it. And so you can see that we're more thoroughly integrating this approach to computation into the code base itself. Now, this is an approach that, in practice, doesn't seem to work very well at all. And there's an entire talk to be given about why this doesn't work. And I won't go into that right now. And we could make the argument that the NumPy approach may or may not work very well either. Although, as a matter of practicality, we can see that a number of real-world projects are built on top of NumPy, so we can guess that it's probably good enough. That said, let's take a look at what I mean by NumPy not integrating into Python. This crisis of not being able to integrate into the vernacular, where you have some residual piece or some, some piece of language that can be incorporated into a sentence, can be incorporated into the vernacular, but is very clearly not part of the vernacular and is very clearly distinct from it. That may convey some very set meaning and may have a very specific purpose for existing, but it's not a fluent expression of the computation. So there are a lot of trivial examples of this. 
Uh, in raw Python, you might have a list of values, and you might want to check if that list is empty by saying if excess. And this is the most idiomatic way that you'd write this in Python. But if you try this on a NumPy ND array, it'll fail because the if operation will try to, or less the if statement will try to determine a Boolean for every element in the, in the, actual, under, the actual NumPy array. And that'll require broadcasting. And it'll say something like the truth value is ambiguous because you can only talk about the truth value in terms of all of them being true or any of them being true. There's some automatic broadcasting happening behind the scenes. And so in order to make this work, you'd have to do if len excess. And suddenly, your NumPy code, for such a simple, trivial example, now has, or rather your Python code, for such a simple, trivial example, now has to be aware of the distinctions between fluent Python, using lists and all the built-in data types, and this NumPy approach. And now scattered throughout your code, you're going to do these things, which a non-NumPy aware Python programmer would look at and say, that's not idiomatic. That doesn't really jive with the way that I've been told how to write code. And there are more examples. So for example, in Python, we have very nice utilities like generators. We have these structures that allow us to, to convey the idea of potentially unbounded sets uh, of data, potentially unbounded streams of data that may be represented as lazy computations. And here, if we do something as simple as try and put an NumPy ND array, we end up with this piece of nonsense, which has a generator inside an array, and it's absolutely not what you'd want. And you might argue that the behavior of NumPy here is totally reasonable, that the semantics of putting a generator into an ND array are ambiguous, and that's fine. But you can see that we're beginning to use very basic features of Python, and yet every time we use them with NumPy, we have to know what's going on. If we were to put this into a list, it would work perfectly. If we were to put it into an ND array, suddenly something dramatically different happens. So there's, there's a problem here where this NumPy code doesn't quite integrate as we'd want. Uh, for, an ex for another example, we can see in some cases that our NumPy code works very nice when we're talking only about very restrained computations. So this is my favorite NumPy example. It shows off most of the features of NumPy. It's just an implementation of Newton's method where you know, we take something we're trying to solve for. Here we're trying to solve for square roots. We take the function, we take the derivative, and then we iterate where each subsequent estimate is equal to the previous estimate minus the function, of the evaluation of the function divided by the evaluation of the derivative of the function. And we can encode this in Python in this fashion. Very straightforward. It uses fancy indexing. It uses the broadcast operations. And we can see, in the case of something like Newton's method, we have some very nice characteristics. We can get, within only five steps, convergence down to this decimal place. You can see the convergence and how quickly it comes together. And for an example, you can say, well, that's a use of NumPy that seems to work fine. But as we make these examples, or as we integrate these examples into real code bases, or as the structure of our code becomes more prominent, we can see that the NumPy approach kind of falls apart. So as an example of that, let's take a look at some very, very basic hand-coded evolutionary programming, where we want to do fitness proportion selection, one-point crossover, and bit flip mutation, and nothing more. And our fitness function is just the number of ones in some array of zeros or ones. And so we might write this function to calculate the fitness. We might write this function in a very pure Pythonic style in order to compute um, a random chromosome. We might write this in order to create populations. We might want to test this over a population of size 5 and size 10. And you can see we're mixing Python real lists and NumPy ND arrays. So we have a list of lists. And so as we do this, we might want to compute the fitness of everything. And so we have to write our code in this fashion. And then we might want to calculate the probabilities, because we have probabilities weighting the selection. So we might, want to, we might need to write code in this fashion, and so on. And when we want to write the crossover, we'd have to write our crossover code like this. And when we actually end up writing all the code for this, and we actually end up trying it, it'll work. What we'll find out is that it's dog slow. And it's dog slow because you're bouncing between pure Python code and NumPy code, and you haven't clearly defined the domain in which you want to perform the computations. And even though your code seems very fluent in Python and seems like something that is very amenable to how a pure Python programmer with no experience with NumPy would write the code, you'll see that the performance is, is totally, uh, totally just not even close to what you want. And the only way that you'd be able to address this would be to rewrite the entire thing, fixing the entirety of that computation in one gigantic multi-dimensional NumPy array. This is what I mean by saying integration with the vernacular. NumPy is a great and very practical approach for solving problems in Python, but it very poorly integrates with the Python vernacular. In the same way 
that, for example, MATLAB has this hidden vector language that doesn't integrate very well with the imperative style of MATLAB. And in the very same way that you can see in classical Chinese, I told you I'd bring it back. <laughs> classical Chinese has a situation where you have these classical set phrases that are very meaningful and convey a lot in a very short amount of space, but are very obvious and just do not integrate with vernacular Chinese. So that's my talk. My name is James Powell. It's a pleasure being here today. <laughs>